Let's talk about characters. Characters are fun because it's really the birth of your TV children. So I really think about it in terms of that. I have the best time naming characters. It's such a great procrastination tool to go on like baby name finder and find like what, what you're gonna name them. Sometimes the name just comes to me and I'm like, oh my God, I know what their name is. And it's so exciting. So take a minute and have some fun naming your characters, naming your babies. But before you name them, you really wanna know who they are and how they inhabit the world. So for one day at a time, we had sort of a template because Norman had set up this show from the 70s. But Mike and I will talk about how we added some and changed some as a result of the types of stories that we wanted to tell. So because of my perspective, I wanted there to be a mother character. I actually wanted there to be parents, but we really wanted to keep the single motherness of it all and really kind of tell the story through this matriarchy. We wanted to have the mother live there. So it was gonna be the mother character, which we were gonna add, that was not in the original series. And by adding the mother character and having Penelope and then having her have two daughters, which was what the original series was, it seemed like there were so many women and that we had an opportunity, especially with a Latinx comedy family show to tell the story of a young male as well. So Mike and I both had daughter and son. We were like, all right, let's do a boy and a girl. That way we get that male, that masculine energy in there too. We added the mother, we changed the son, we talked about who are these people, what do they care about, and how are their perspectives unique? One of the things whenever I'm writing a pilot and I'm thinking about characters is what are the things they're talking about and how do their conversations complement one another and where is the conflict? Because for a very long time, I made the mistake of writing people that just got along with each other. And that's fine. It's just not as interesting to watch two people get along for a very long time. And I, I learned that the very hard way. I learned very, very uh, early on that just having characters like get along with each other without any sort of, and it didn't have to be them yelling at each other, but they needed to have some form of conflict. So thinking about what are the conflicts that these characters have with one another, I think is really important. I also think it's really fun to pull from your own life. Not that you have to. We are writers, we can make stuff up, and we will make stuff up a lot. But even if they have like a, a little starting point, like, the character of Lydia is not my mom anymore. You know, we, we've turned her into something else. She has elements of my mom within her, but she's also much more selfish and much more vain and much more, all these wonderful things. And then the actress, the amazing Rita Moreno, adds even more texture to that. So it starts to morph into something else. But even if you have a starting point, like Penelope's not exactly me, but a lot of the things that she thinks and feels and that are important to her come from my personal perspective. And then the same with the kids. The kids are sort of like Mike Royce's kids. And then Mike himself has a little bit of Dr. Berkowitz and has a little bit of Schneider in him. So we really infuse the show with parts of who we are. In many ways, I feel like the three women are also me. I feel like there's parts of me that are like Lydia, parts of me that are like Penelope, and parts of me that are like Elena. And all of those parts are constantly fighting in my head. That's why I'm a writer. So think about who these people are and how these people fit into the world that you have created. Then have fun with who they are. Write little dossiers about your character. Where did they go to school? How many siblings do they have? What part of the world did they grow up in? How did that inform how they think and feel about things? Uh, what is their favorite movie? What would their coffee drink be at Starbucks? And don't make those arbitrary, make those for a reason. I think When Harry Met Sally is one of my favorite movies and it's because there's so many specifics in there that without saying who the character is, you get who they are. When Sally orders something before we know who she is, we know who she is right after she orders. We know that she's that type of woman that likes things the way she likes them and has a very particular point of view about how she should eat and what should be on her plate. You know, same with Harry when he's give, dosing out his advice and eat, chewing grapes and spitting the seeds out the window. He's that guy. He's a little bit messy around the edges. So think about shows that you love and characters that you love and why you love those characters. What are the specific things about them that make them interesting and unique? Who are the people in your life that are like that? Infuse some of the characters with those things and then see how those characters start to come together and how they would you know, I love a dumb guy. I love a dumb guy so much. Joey in the pilot of Friends is not a dumb guy. Watch the pilot of Friends. He's not a dumb guy yet. They found it because Matt LeBlanc is, and it's hard to play a dumb guy. Matt LeBlanc was able to do that wonderful, clueless dumb guy thing, but give it texture and layer so it wasn't one note. 
And same with Monica. Monica wasn't like super anal retentive in the pilot of Friends. They found that as they got to know who that character was. But once they found that thing, it became such a great place to go to for joke. I think that if you think about that, if you watch shows and you think about what the characters are, what are the things that they fight about? Why do they fight about those things? How do you do that in your own writing? How do you do that in your own work? What would be a really, really fun character to have somewhere? and kind of take it from there. The character journey, I think, is really important. One Day at a Time is really, it's an ensemble, but it is through the lens of this single mom. So everything is really gonna rotate around her. And the stories are mostly gonna come from her point of view. And uh, if there is a B story, it's still gonna probably hit on her A story at some point. So think about who your characters are. In a show like Friends, it's an ensemble. So some weeks it might be, there's a story about, Monica and Rachel doing something and there's going to be a B story about uh, Chandler and Joey doing something and then there's going to be a crazy C story runner where Phoebe is playing a smelly cat at the at the local coffee shop. So watch those and break them down. I think that's a really great way to think about ensemble storytelling versus uh, main character storytelling. Also think about characters in terms of are they active characters or reactive characters. I think your main character should be active. A lot of times when we're writing main characters, we have funny people come in and do stuff and they're just reactive. And that's when it's, I don't know, it doesn't feel as alive uh, when that's happening. I think that you need your main character to constantly be active. Maybe somebody is gonna guide them towards being active or push them to being more active, but you want that main character to constantly be on some specific journey where they want something and they're actively going after that something. They might be failing, they might be fighting, going on the date, but they're actively fighting by doing, cleaning the apartment or going, reorganizing the fridge or they're active in their, in their inactivity of wanting to do the thing that they need to do, right? So find whatever that journey is for them so that there's stuff happening. I would also say like, I think one of the greatest things I always do uh, when I'm writing is kill characters. It's always happens. I'll create like four characters and then I'm like, oh, those two are a little similar. And unless I can make them super different, I need to kill one and merge them together. You know, sometimes in the writing of it, you're gonna realize they got nothing to say and you gotta get rid of them because they're not really adding to the pilot. Maybe they'll be a recurring character later on, but sorry, Bill, peace out. You don't get to be in the pilot anymore. Yeah, you know, it's, a lot of people ask me about, about longevity of character. I think what is interesting in the reality of it you can think you know where the characters are going, but you might not know where they're going. Once we decided that Schneider was going to be an addict, I think we always knew like at some point it will be interesting if we get to be with this character for a long time, it would be interesting to see the thing that would make him relapse and what the journey back to recovery would look like. I think that was always in the back of our minds, but we didn't know we were gonna do that season three until we did it but it certainly was something we knew we would investigate if given the opportunity to. But characters will surprise you on the way. There's things that you may very well want to have them go on that as you're going through the journey of creating a series, fall away and other things will pop up. And the reality is that once you get on a show and once you're working with actors, there's also all these wonderful things the actors infuse into the character. So maybe you always saw the character as being super, uh, type A, but then you get a, an actress who's a little more chill, so the type A stuff doesn't really play and you're gonna lean in to the chill thing a little bit more. Uh, I think that's where like little lovely miracles happen in the true collaboration of television writing begins, is when it becomes an amalgam of all of these different um, people who make the character its own thing. The true reality is you don't have to know that much about these characters because you're probably not gonna get to see them live more uh, than your pilot. Maybe you will, but if not, just think of how do I write the best, most concise, funniest uh, pilot that I can possibly write and constantly be looking at it and rewriting it and rewriting it and making it a little bit better and a little bit tighter and set it down for a month and then read it again and go, ooh, I mean, I can't read things I wrote a year ago. I'm like, oh, I'd, I'd do this and I'd do this and I'd do this, which is now because I've taught my brain how to do that. I think at the beginning, you're just so proud that you've written something that you're like, I did it. And, and it's a little bit more complicated than that. So learn from me. This is all a learn from me, you guys. I made a lot of mistakes. That's characters, you guys. That's characters. You got the characters. Now let's keep going. 
Now we're gonna talk a little bit about research. One of the reasons I think it's great to do the right what you know is because you are the expert about what you know. So if you worked in a yogurt shop, amazing. You'll have a million stories about yogurt shops. If you grew up in a certain type of neighborhood, amazing. You'll have a million stories about that neighborhood. The moment you start veering off of what you know into other worlds, you have to do research. So whatever that world is, if it's a medical show and you are not a doctor and did not grow up around doctors, then you need to do your research to make sure that these people are sounding correct. So for example, on One Day at a Time, Penelope plays a nurse. So we have a medical consultant that makes sure that we're talking about things in the correct way. We also have uh, Musa, which is a uh, veteran army specialist that our consultants. There were certain things that we wrote in the script that we have them read and then they go, oh yeah, we'd never say that or we would say this or this is the, a, a way that somebody that was in service would say this line. They're so incredibly helpful when we're writing those uh, group therapy scenes. They're just terminology and little specifics that they make sound more correct. So I would say the best way to probably do that is to write what you're gonna write as much as you can, research what you can, and then if you write a scene and give a scene to somebody and say, hey, you're a doctor, can you look this over and see if it like makes sense? And then, you know, buy them a coffee or take them to dinner or do something, send them flowers or a gift certificate for their favorite restaurant or something as a thank you. The more people uh, want to sit down and take very personal stories from people, it can get into a tricky space, right? It can veer on life rights. It can, it depends. It depends. But when you're starting out just to be safe, maybe it's better to say, this is what I want to talk about. This is where I was thinking. Uh, since you're somebody that's lived in that world, can you guide me and make sure that I'm doing the right things? I think that might be the best way to go about doing it initially so that you can be true to it, but you're not infringing too much upon them. Also, huge thing, never take stuff from other writers. Never do that. If a writer friend tells you something, don't use that in your script because they're a writer and they're gonna write it in their own script possibly. So that's a big no-no, don't do that. Okay, minorities. This is really tricky. One of the reasons why I wanted to write the Cuban perspective is because I'm Cuban. I know that perspective. I know the West, but by the way, I know the West Coast grew up on the West Coast Cuban perspective. I can't speak to the Miami Cuban perspective or the New Jersey Cuban perspective. Even though there might be some things that cross over, I have a very specific point of view from growing up West Coast as a Cuban. So that's why I wanted to write that point of view because other people might say, that's not how it is. And I can say, well, it is for my family and I can defend it. I can defend it and I can be honest and I can uh, know what I'm talking about because I have literally lived it. So I grew up in San Diego. I grew up amongst a ton of Mexicans. So I feel very confident that I could write a Mexican experience story. But even still, if I had a writer's room, if that show got, got to series, I would want to hire writers that reflected that point of view so I could be really, really, really on point with the specificity of what it is to grow up Mexican in California, right? So the same is true really of anything, you know, like when we wanted to represent characters that were non-binary or characters that were trans or characters that were disabled, we did not have those already in our room. While we had a very inclusive room, we didn't, it did not include those things. So we had to do our research, we had to talk to people, we had to consult with our uh, actors and make sure that we were being very specific to their point of view. And we just tried to create a really inclusive environment so that we were able to do research, uh, allow people to come in with their stories about people they knew who were like this and try to write it as specifically as we could given all of the new information we had, even though we didn't have actual representation of that in our room. I mean, ideally you have all representation in your room, but it's kind of impossible to be able to do that with every single thing. And you don't want that to get in the way of you being able to write those characters. So you gotta do some extra work on that front. And I think it's really important to do that work because it lends to a more interesting and specific character that people then hopefully will fall in love with. On our show, when it came to talking about sensitive subjects, you really have to do, do it through the framework of the tone of the show that you're working on and also through the specific point of views of the characters. So for one day at a time, the uh, deportation episode, which was in season one, Norman had the idea, oh my gosh, it would be so amazing if Lydia thought she was gonna be deported or Lydia was deported. 
And it was great because I, ha I got to say, well, Norman, actually, Cubans can't be deported. <laughs> um, and he's like, what? What are you talking about? And I said, yeah, there's different rules for different Latinx people in this country. He didn't know that. And we were like, oh, well, that's interesting. Like, maybe we can also educate people that there's different rules for different people, because a lot of people don't know that, and talk about what's specific to this family, but also do the work of setting up a character who we would end up liking and falling in love with earlier so that by the time we got to this episode and her parents were deported, we cared. So that's what brought in the Carmen character. We brought in the Carmen character a few episodes before so that we got to know her and like her and know she was Elena's best friend and be invested in who she was and think she was funny and silly and just a, a silly teenage girl. And then we realized, oh, there's more there there with this character once we realized her parents were deported. So that was the work of that is that subject was brought up in the room, we talked about it, then we thought about it through the framework of these characters, how we've set up these characters to be people that care for people outside of their family and bringing people in constantly to be like family once they come into their home and what that would look like. So one of the things that was very interesting is we needed a character to have the very opposite point of view, to be sort of that ugly American point of view. And we had the character of Scott, because we were like, we don't want Schneider to say those things. First of all, he's not American, he's Canadian. And some of that stuff's gonna be too unlikable on Schneider, a character we wanna keep in this family for a long time. We don't want him to think those things. So let's bring in Scott. How can we get everybody to the apartment? Oh, we could have a work event at the apartment. How could we do that? Oh, Berkowitz's birthday party, Penelope's gonna throw it. So that's kind of how it all came together. How do we get all these people in our main set to talk about this one thing and to have all those point of views? And in this case, it wasn't a point of view that one of our main family members could have. We needed to bring in one of our outside established characters in order to have that opinion. Luckily, it was already in line with how we've already established Scott to be. So he became that voice so that we could do that in that episode. So anytime we're talking about something sensitive, we bring it up in the room first. And this is what making, uh, when you do have a staff, if you are in a really inclusive staff that has many different ages, many different, different gender, different ages, different uh, points of view, different backgrounds, it makes those conversations really, really interesting. If everyone is comfortable to speak, and look, that takes a long time. Um, I was so uncomfortable in writer's rooms for a very long time. Uh, it was just a space that's, that can be scary. And when you first get in there, it can be hard. Uh, so it takes time. And so now that I'm on this side of it, now, I'm a sh now that I'm a showrunner, I think it's really important to try to make people feel as comfortable as they can. Because I remember what it was like sitting in those chairs. And I don't want them to hold back ideas that might be really, really good because they're scared to say something. So trying to create an environment that is really open so that people feel comfortable to say, this is what I think, well, I don't think that, and have disagreements that can be better and can make the story better, especially when dealing with really sensitive material. Uh, we'd have some really good fights in there and end up on the other side all learning something that would make it into the show. Thank you so much for watching. It's not over here, you guys. You can still tweet me at Everything Gloria. I'm on Instagram, I'm on Twitter. I'm still available to you. So keep asking those questions, keep doing the work. Make sure to watch all of the other Hollywood 101 videos on Beto Likes' YouTube channel. This is Gloria Calderon-Kellett. Good luck.